Did Blackbeard wreck his own flagship, the Queen Anne's Revenge, on purpose in Beaufort Inlet, North Carolina? I'm Bayless C. Brooks, and this is The Quest for Blackbeard, the true story of Edward Teach and his world. The damning evidence that Captain Charles Johnson used against Edward Blackbeard Teach to accuse him of wrecking his flagship, Queen Anne's Revenge, on purpose, is the deposition of David Harriet of Jamaica. Harriet gave this evidence in return for amnesty. He and Ignatius Pell agreed to turn state's evidence against Steed Bonnet, and perhaps for Blackbeard's future trial. The trials of Major Steed Bonnet and other pirates printed in 1719 holds this deposition. If you look at the trial's title page, you will not see their names on the list of pirates being tried in Charleston in October-November 1718. In his almost five-page deposition, David Harriet claimed to be an innocent party who was just minding his own business when Teach came along and shanghaied him as a pirate. That about six days after they left the bar of Charlestown, they arrived at Topsail Inlet in North Carolina, having then under their command the said ship Queen Anne's Revenge, the sloop commanded by Richards, this deponent's sloop commanded by one Captain Hands, one of the said pirate crew, and a small empty sloop which they found near the Havana. And this deponent in the voyage from South Carolina to North lost company, but heard they took one mason, and heard Thatch afterwards blame Richards for not burning said mason's vessel, because she belonged to Boston that the next morning after they had all got safe into Topsail Inlet except Thatch, the said Thatch's ship Queen Anne's Revenge run aground off the bar of Topsail Inlet, and the said Thatch sent his quartermaster to command this deponent's sloop to come to his assistance, but she ran aground likewise about gunshot from the said Thatch before his said sloop could come to their assistance, and both the said Thatch's ship and this deponent's sloop were wrecked, and the said Thatch and all the other sloop's companies went on board the Revenge, afterwards called the Royal James, and on board the other sloop they found her empty off the Havana. Says t'was generally believed the said Thatch run his vessel aground on purpose to break up the companies and to secure what money and effects he had got for himself and such other of them as he had most value for that after the said ship and this deponent's sloop were so cast away, this deponent requested the said Thatch would let him have a boat, and a few hands to go to some inhabited place in North Carolina, or to Virginia, there being very few and poor inhabitants in Topsail Inlet, where they were, and desired the said Thatch to make this deponent some satisfaction for his said sloop, both of which said Thatch promised to do. But instead thereof, ordered this deponent with about sixteen more to be put on shore on a small sandy hill or bank, a league distant from the main, on which place there was no inhabitant nor provisions, where this deponent and the rest remained two nights and one day and expected to perish, for that the said Tatch took away their boat. And as Charles Johnson, or Nathaniel Mist, put it in his book, a general history of the robberies and murders of the most notorious pirates. From the bar of Charlestown, they sailed to North Carolina, Captain Teach in the ship, which they called the Man of War, Captain Richards and Captain Hands in the sloops, which they termed privateers, and another sloop serving them as a tender. Teach began now to think of breaking up the company, and securing the money and the best of the effects for himself and some others of his companions he had the most friendship for, and to cheat the rest. Accordingly, on pretense of running into Topsail Inlet to clean, he grounded his ship, and then as if it had been done undesignedly, and by accident, he orders Hans Sloops to come to his assistance, and get him off again, which he endeavouring to do, ran the sloop on shore near the other, and so were both lost. This done, Teach goes into the tender sloop with forty hands, and leaves the revenge there, then takes seventeen others and maroons them upon a small sandy island, about a league from the main, where there was neither bird, beast, or herb for their subsistence, 
and where they must have perished if Major Bonnet had not two days after taken them off. An analysis of the trial documents proves that only two men blamed Edward Teach for destroying his own ship. This was David Harriet and Ignatius Pell, the two men who had turned state's evidence for amnesty. Of the 30 pirates who offered testimony at that trial, only three of them mentioned anything about losing the ship at all, and those three were neutral. Absolutely no one else blamed Edward Teach for wrecking his own ship, even the men that he marooned in North Carolina. As for the details pertaining to Steed Bonnet's capture, escape, and Harriet's aid deposition and death, there was more to this tale than most authors have revealed, and the life of Mariner Richard Tuckerman, his wife Catherine, and their family of Goose Creek, South Carolina, reveals a bit more about South Carolina's ingrained piratical nature itself. It lends an excellent example toward understanding the generally favorable outlook upon pirates and piracy as opposed to the official stance against it. Aristocrats not involved in that sort of business hated it for the trouble that it caused them. Those involved in it took great pride in being a pirate, and those of the majority who benefited from it treated pirates as great heroes and often aided their escape. Following the late September 1718 battle in the Cape Fear River, Colonel William Rhett and his anti-pirate forces arrived in Charlestown with Major Steed Bonnet and his crew as prisoners. Lacking a public prison at the time, they were confined in the watch house under militia guard. On the 5th of October, officers removed Bonnet from the watch house and confined him in Provost Marshal Nathaniel Partridge's house in town. A few days later, Bonnet's sailing master David Harriet and his boatswain Ignatius Pell, as presumed witnesses for the prosecution, joined Bonnet in Partridge's home. Two militia guards were assigned to watch them at night to prevent a possible escape. However, on 24th of October, Bonnet and Harriet were successful in doing just that, with local help. Pell refused to take advantage of the opportunity and remained in confinement, but Harriet took quick advantage of the chance to escape. Just how innocent could he be? Bonnet and Harriet made it as far as Sullivan's Island, where a battle ensued with the governor's forces. Harriet was killed by gunfire, and Bonnet was recaptured. Ready! Aim! Fire! Admiralty Judge Nicholas Trott announced at the trial proceedings, Bonnet's escape out of prison is no small misfortune to us. I hope the great reward of seven hundred pounds offered by the government for taking Bonnet and his master will make the people vigilant in apprehending them. I am sensible Bonnet has had some assistance in making his escape, and if we can discover the offenders, we shall not fail to bring them to exemplary punishment. Richard Tuckerman was later discovered to have provided Bonnet and Harriet with a canoe, weapons, and slaves after freeing them from confinement. A reward of 700 pounds was an extraordinary sum for recapturing Bonnet and the supposedly innocent Harriet. Lieutenant Robert Maynard, Captain Ellis Brand, and Captain George Gordon, who famously captured Blackbeard and his crew later that month in Ocracoke Inlet, fought over the paltry 200-pound reward offered for the most notorious pirate of them all. The South Carolina officials had to fight an uphill battle against popular opinion. We don't generally see that opinion expressed in Admiralty Court records since the majority voices cannot be heard in the official correspondence. Only the official reactions to it can occasionally be ascertained, like this strained reaction to recapture these men. Substantial South Carolina mariner Richard Tuckerman, who knew many of Benjamin Hornigold's crew, traded in the Bahamas and later served with the pirate Bartholomew Roberts, also appeared perhaps as flamboyant and bold as Edward Teach himself and must have been perceived by his public as a great hero. Blackbeard was truly innocent of the charge of wrecking his own ship and killing his crew. 
Moreover, he probably never intended for Bonnet's crew to perish on their maroon island either. Bonnet found them in two days. The QAR was the best asset Teach had taken during his whole career. He simply made the best of a bad situation once the accident occurred, and no evidence of his crew's supposed deaths has ever been found. The enormously successful pirate Edward Teach was not the notorious and villainous pirate King Blackbeard, or Satan from Hell, as Mist wrote him to be. He was an educated aristocrat, likely grandson of an Anglican minister trained at Oxford. His family in Spanish Town, Jamaica, owned an estate with slaves. They probably rode in their personal carriage to church and conversed with assemblymen and their families in the palace square. And he was a veteran, having served his nation during Queen Anne's War aboard a massive 60-gun frigate of the Royal Navy. Again, I'm Bayless C. Brooks, and this has been another episode in The Quest for Blackbeard, the true story of Edward Teach and his world. Thank you for listening.